Welcome to Speaking of Grace, the weekly message podcast from the Whole Life Church in Orlando, Florida. We're a multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multi-generational congregation committed to our mission of loving people into a lifelong friendship with God. We are committed to our vision of being a church without walls, fully engaged in serving the people of our community. Thank you for joining us as we continue Speaking of Grace. Hey there, family. I found my voice. There we go. I hope you all are having a wonderful Sabbath. I sure am. And uh, it is my privilege to do some introductions. Remember, uh, last couple weeks I've been talking about follow me. And one of the things I said during that conversation was that when you love somebody, you want to introduce them to other people you love, right? That when you really think somebody's awesome, you really want to introduce them to the other people in your life that are important to you. And so today, that's exactly what I get to do with our speaker. I love this guy. In fact, um, a realization came to me a little while ago that I was thinking about mortality. It's good to do that every once in a while. And I thought, well, who would I want to do my memorial service? And the speaker today is who I would want to do my memorial service if something had. Now, I'm not planning on going anywhere, so don't, 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 let's not get ahead of ourselves. I'm just saying, if something did, that's, that's who I'd want. Um, Furman Fordham Jr., affectionately known by Puck to his friends and family. Um, so if I mess up and say Puck, that's, that's what, what's going on there. Um, but Furman and I pastored not 15 minutes away from each other for several years and didn't realize it. And when we finally met, for me, Furman was one of those transformational friendships, a friendship that changes your life in important and special ways. Um, And we met in Nashville. I am thrilled today that he's agreed to come here and speak to you. There's a lot of amazing things I could tell you about Furman. I could tell you that he's working on his PhD right now. I could tell you that he works at the South Central Conference where basically his job is to help churches find their mission and and mentor pastors to be missional about what they do. And he's phenomenal at that. But I think one of the other things he'd want you to know is that he loves his wife. In fact, part of his mission and purpose is to be an adoring husband. And, And so he's been married for 26 years to Jennifer. He has three boys. Yeah. He and Jennifer, I should say, have three uh, amazing uh, sons that are fantastic human beings. Um, So I could tell you all those things, um, and those are amazing things about him. But the thing that that matters the most and where our hearts as brothers connect is that we love Jesus. And I know that Jesus is going to be held high before you today as you listen to Furman speak to you, because he's not speaking just to you from him. You're going to feel the Holy Spirit speaking through him. Happy Sabbath, church family. Thank you so much, Candice and Ron, for reminding us that God has heard. That is good news to know that God has heard. It is an honor and a privilege to be here with you. I want to thank my friend, my brother, Uh, Ken, for those very kind words I shared during the first service that I am praying that his demise will not be soon, Uh, but it really touched me uh, to hear. You know, it's it's horrible to have a one-sided relationship. I, I, I would hate to think that, man, I just love Ken, but the feeling is not mutual. But, man, I'm so glad that God has put a mutual love in our hearts one for another. What Ken did not share with you is that in Nashville, he pastored a predominantly white Caucasian church, and I pastored a predominantly black African-American church. And our relationship was formed over being candid, having candid conversations about race matters. And what we found out is that deeper beneath the skin and the surface, we don't just have the same red blood, we have the same saved ransom blood of Jesus Christ flowing through our veins. Ken, I love you like a brother, and it is so good to be here with you. And I just want to thank this congregation for welcoming uh, the Wetmore family 
and for just allowing them uh, to blossom and bloom where God has planted them. Now, I I have a a problem. I was put on a 25-minute timer during the first service, and uh, they actually gave me a few more minutes for this one. And I got I got a sister here who's already worshiping. I just, I, I need to remind myself that uh, we have other things that are on the calendar, and I'm going to try my best to be constrained. But I need to tell you a secret. If you talk to me, uh, I will talk back to you. Uh, but don't push me too much because that yellow timer is counting down. I have seen quite a few individuals. I saw... Uh, one of my sons, Dean's, Dean Medley, so good to see you, my brother. Then I saw a classmate from back in the day, Al, my brother, good to see you. Then my brothers, my brother-in-law's brother and wife, Fred and Anita Goodman, I just feel like I am at home. I want to invite you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 7 through 10 as we consider the subject for our Black History Month celebration, I'm on my way to the Canaan land. I'm on my way to the Canaan land. In the New King James Version, Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 10, reads like this. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, verse 9. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression which which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I'm on my way to the Canaan land. Would you bow your heads with me? Hover o'er me, Holy Spirit. Bathe my trembling heart and brow. Fill me with your hallowed presence. Come, oh, come and fill me now. Fill me now, fill me now, only you can fill me now. So fill me with thy hallowed presence. Come, please come, and fill us now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. There's a photo, a meme that was circulating around the internet. It's a picture of an empty parking lot at a gym that was taken early December. This next picture is early January. This third picture is early February. A strange thing happens between our New Year's resolutions and a year's conclusion. Our subject today talks about the strange thing that happens between leaving Egypt and getting into Canaan. Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 through 14 says, A new Pharaoh came to power who knew not Joseph, and he moved upon his people to enslave the children of Israel. The Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. Say that with me. The Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. Exodus chapter 2 says that they cried out to God 
because of Egypt. Say that with me. They cried out to God because of Egypt. But our verse in Exodus chapter 3, specifically verse 8 in the New Century Version, God says, I have come down to save them from the Egyptians. I will bring them out of that land and lead them to a good land, a good land with lots of room, a fertile land. It is the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. The Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. They cried out to God because of Egypt. God promised to deliver them out of Egypt and to bring them into Canaan. The first thing I need us to grasp is that salvation is always delivering out of and bringing into. The children of Israel were to be delivered out of Egypt and brought into Canaan. Notice how over and over again, God's promise to deliver and bring out of is connected with his plan to bring into. In Exodus chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, God tells Moses to tell the elders that he's about to come and deliver. God says, go and gather the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, appeared to me saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. Look at verse 17. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites. Salvation is always delivering out of and bringing into. In Exodus chapter 6, after Pharaoh demands that they make the same amount of bricks without giving them straw, God tells Moses to say, therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. That's the delivering out of, but look at verse 8. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now in Exodus chapter 13, this is their New Year's Day. They have now been delivered. There have been 10 plagues that have decimated Egypt, and Pharaoh has requested that they leave his land and bless them on the way. And as they are headed out, Moses is told to tell the children of Israel to remember the day this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. But verse 5 says, and it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of Canaan. Even on their New Year's celebration, they celebrated that they were delivered out of, but they remembered that the promise included bringing them into. Salvation is always delivering out of and bringing into. Even in Exodus chapter 15, as the children of Israel saw this smoke cloud rising and realized that Pharaoh and his army were in hot pursuit, God tells Moses to tell them to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God makes a highway in the middle of the river. The children of Israel walk through and 
Pharaoh and his army is drowned in the sea. Then Miriam takes the tambourine and sings the song of Moses. They sing Exodus 15, 1 and 2. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. They are praising God because he's delivered them out of. But the song continues in verse 17. You will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance. Salvation is not just deliverance from Egypt. Salvation includes deliverance from Egypt, but it's just not completed by deliverance from Egypt. Now, don't get confused and start fearing you have no assurance. Were the children of Israel delivered? Were they free? Had they not been saved? But scripture describes salvation in three time frames. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. That's the Greek perfect tense. It's a completed action suggesting that salvation is past. But 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2 says, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also, English standard version, you are being saved. Present tense, continuous action. And Romans 10 verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Future tense. And I should throw in parenthetically that all of them are in the passive voice. That means the subject is the recipient of the action. We don't save ourselves. We are saved. <laughs> Salvation is not just deliverance from. It continues to include bringing in two. But here is where we have a problem. There is a desert between Egypt and Canaan. Salvation is delivering out of and bringing in two but you must be taken through. Theologically, we call being delivered out of justification. Oh, we like justification. We, we like being delivered out of. We like texts like, for we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, deserving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. We like for when we were yet sinners, when we were in due need, when we were in due time in need of Christ's righteousness. God, not because of what we had done, but because of what we could not do. God, by his love, demonstrated that love toward us. And while we were sinners, Christ died for us. We love the idea that we've been delivered out of. 
And we also love the promise that will be brought into. We love the soon I will be done with the troubles of this world. Gonna lay down my sword and shield and study war no more. We love that he will wipe every tear from our eyes and there be no more death and sorrow and crying and no more pain. We love that this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality. We love the being brought out of and being brought into. But something strange happens when God tries to take us through. See if you can notice yourself in the experience of the children of Israel. They have been delivered from, and God is trying to bring them into. So he must, sanctification, bring them through. But literally, one month After deliverance, we read in Exodus chapter 16, verse 3, and the children of Israel said to them, oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. The hardship of hunger makes them forget that they were the ones who originally requested that they be delivered in the first place. It's the equivalent of us forgetting the sweat on our brow and the whip of that taskmaster. And we come to God December 31. Lord, I'm tired of this weight. I just want to lose some pounds. I will make a commitment to go to Planet Fitness. But 30 days later, It ain't that bad just to hang out on the couch. I mean, who's to judge me because I'm a size 25? I I ain't got to find clothes to wear. Strange things happen when we're going through. It happens again in Exodus 17. Look at verse 3. And the people thirsted this time for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? The hardship of thirst gets them to a point where they can't even remember why they wanted to leave Egypt. Some kind of amnesia occurs. We forget that Egypt was frustrating us and embarrassing us and depressing us. We were the ones asking God for deliverance. But some strange things happened. When God is trying to take us through. Numbers 11 verse 5. It happens again. We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Black History Month. This is watermelon. (laughs) This time... It's not hardship, it's preference. They have eaten, they just want something else. The vegetarian and vegan menu just doesn't have enough taste. I got to get me something else. I I need some oxtail or something. I I need I need some curry go I, There's something that happens when God is trying to take us through. We start reckoning that Egypt wasn't that bad. Now here they are, 
Numbers 14, on the brink of the Canaan land. They are right there. The spies have been sent out. Joshua and Caleb have given the report. And then in Numbers chapter 14, verses 2 through 4, and all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us out to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Verse 4, so they said to one another, let's fire Pastor Ken. We are tired of this series on discipleship. We want to go back to Egypt. Let's find some new elders who will help us go back to Egypt. Something strange happened. When we've been delivered from and God is taking us through so that he can get us in too. They are literally right there and they're voting to go back to Egypt. We are told by those who have received the victory over porn addictions that the first few weeks and months are excruciating. It's like your body is going through detox. But if you hold on just a little while longer, breakthrough is along the way. My wife is an intermittent faster. That means she will eat breakfast at 6 and lunch around 12 and then won't eat again until 6 a.m. But sometimes around 6 p.m., my wife, generally speaking, is a very pleasant person. You got to be pleasant to do kindergarten and pre-K and all that kind of stuff, right? But at 6 p.m., she's like the Snickers commercial. She's hungry. But she learned that the hunger pains are proof that the diet is working. See, the reality is God has already gotten us out of Egypt, but now he's trying to get Egypt out of us. And we must hold on and hang in there and allow sanctification to do its work. The hungering, the thirsting is just the detox that we are about to experience Canaan. Moses actually tells us in Deuteronomy 1 verse 2 that their journey could have taken 11 days. But now... The next generation, because their parents refused to let God get Egypt out of them. So they had to wander around the mountain 40 years. I'm talking about 60-year-old men still going to the club. I'm talking about people who should have had some victory by now, still wandering around the same mountain. And now their next generation is here. The old generation is all gone. And can you believe that in Numbers 20, verse 5, new generation says, and why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? Is it not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink? This group, they were just kids in Egypt. Some of them never even lived in Egypt but their parents must have spoken so highly about Egypt that now they want to go back to Egypt. They have refused to learn from their past history. God has to allow a delay so they can go around Edom. And again, Numbers 21 verse 5, the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you not brought us up out of Egypt to die? Why have 
have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water, and our soul loves this worthless bread. They have turned back to Egypt because of hardship, preference, fear, and a failure to learn from the past. And now it's just plain old impatience. God, you're taking too long. Something strange happens while we're going through. But another strange thing that happens is God never gives up on you. Wouldn't you think that after all of the covenants, all of the promises, all of the declarations to do right this time. Wouldn't you think that after we've been forgiven 70 times seven, that God would finally say, enough is enough. I ain't taking y'all to Canaan. Just go on back to Egypt. But my God is long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I am amazed at the fact that the strangest thing is not that we keep desiring to go back to Egypt, but that God never gives up on his promise. My prayer is that the faithfulness of God, the unselfishness of God, the endurance of God, the unconditional love of God, that it would draw you to say, I don't want to turn back on God. I want that kind of relationship. Want to live with God. Love my God. I can't go back. Won't go back to the way things used to be. I've been changed by God and, and healed by God and, and freed by God and delivered by my God. I found joy and I found peace and I found grace and, and I found favor and I won't go back. I, I can't go back to the way it used to be before your presence came and changed me. I won't go back. Can't go back. Because I'm on my way to the Canaan land. The same God who has delivered us out of and is bringing us into has faithfully promised to take us through. In the words of that old Negro spiritual, let's determine that we will never turn back no more. If you are determined to respond to God's faithful love by letting him take you through. Make that commitment. Hi, this is Randy McGray, podcast producer and host here at Whole Life Church. Loving people into a lifelong friendship with God is our mission at the Whole Life Church, and our podcasts are designed to help facilitate conversations that help us grow together in that pursuit. Now that you've heard the message for this week, don't forget to check out the Whole Life Takeaways for this message. Swipe up in today's show notes and join the conversation. Speaking of conversations, each Wednesday morning we take a closer look at the week's message. That's right, the one you just listened to. We discuss practical ways to apply spiritual lessons and ask honest questions about the issues we face as Christians, all focused through the lens of grace. Your voice is a welcomed addition to that conversation. We encourage your thoughts and your questions by sending a voicemail or text to 407-965-1607 or send an email to podcast at wholelife.church. 
You can find everything podcast related on our website, wholelife.church slash podcast. And plan on spending every Tuesday evening and Wednesday morning with us as we bring you the Whole Life Church inspiration you love straight into your headphones. Thanks for listening and have a great week.